Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody, and I'd like to thank the organisers for inviting me um, to come and speak. It's a great pleasure um, to engage in meetings in Bogor, where C4 is actually based. Um, we spend most of our time flying from uh, continent to continent, so I just returned back from, from Europe yesterday, but I'm delighted to actually be based in Bogor for uh, an international meeting of this kind, so I, I, I extend my thanks to the organisers for that. So I'm going to give a very broad overview of, of some of the biodiversity issues that we're addressing as an international research organization, but with a, a focus on, on Southeast Asia. <clears throat> so, you know, in terms of setting the context, we're fully aware that Southeast Asia contains many biodiversity hotspots. Um, it's a, a region of, of extreme biodiversity importance, um, yet, as was mentioned uh, in the introduction, has one of the highest rates of deforestation in the tropics. These major drivers include uh, conversion for agriculture, logging, but also um, unseen, if you like, uh, trade, such as the wildlife trade, which has a long-term impact on the ecology of the, the biodiversity uh, of, of the region. Um, and many really, if you read the literature, the, the future has often portrayed as somewhat bleak for Southeast Asia. Um, and there are lots of issues that, that, that come into play there. The rising population, changing demographics, wealthier populations, the growth of a middle class, all with uh, drivers uh, and changes that, that impact the environment. Um, and another challenge that we're particularly interested in at C4, and that's the issue of food security. Uh, and what is the future of food security in the Asian region? And I'll talk, touch on that later on in the talk. And finally, I'm going to touch on the issue of research. Coming from an international research organization, I have to uh, at least engage a little bit on the research aspect of, of uh, the work in Southeast Asia. So we're fully aware of, of where Southeast Asia lies in terms of the biodiversity hotspots. I don't need to point them out. Um, and just to re-emphasize, four major um, phytochoria, four major phytogeographical regions in Southeast Asia with high levels of species diversity and endemism. And that's really the crux of what we're looking at here, the, 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 the fundamental diversity uh, and complexity of the ecosystems and, and environment here in Southeast Asia. But much of this biodiversity is under threat. Most of you who are familiar with the work of Navjot Soji, the late uh, Navjot Soji uh, from the University of Singapore, um, did a very interesting study looking at pro projected extinctions um, for um, Southeast Asia compared to Singapore. Singapore has gone through this huge transition from in its environment uh, to a much uh, clearly urbanized society and has gone through major extinction processes in, in, in the same way. And he, he projected basically that much of Southeast Asia would follow that route. And the, the figures you see on the right um, in yellow are the, the, the best case scenarios, the, the numbers of extinctions per tax, taxonomic group, and in the red, the worst case scenarios. So we're looking at major um, uh, changes in, in biodiversity and, and long-term uh, extinction factors. In terms of protected areas, we've seen an exponential increase in protected areas, both in terms of size, but also in number. But if you look at the graph on the right, you can see that in terms of biodiversity loss, um, we're seeing uh, considerable amounts of biodiversity loss um, correlated to, to um, uh, the increase in protected areas. And we have to ask ourselves, are these protected areas actually having uh, a major impact on conserving biodiversity? We often describe protected areas as the last reservoirs of biodiversity, but in fact 68 and 70 percent of the biodiversity of Southeast Asia occurs outside of protected areas. And so given the investment in, in the protected area process, we have to perhaps reappraise uh, and think about new ways of protecting the biodiversity um, that rem is remnant in Southeast Asia. Um, there's been changes in forest cover, as we know, in Southeast Asia, considerable changes. And I'm not quite sure why India is, is, um, is circled here in this, this slide. But you can see that in, in some countries, particularly China, India, Vietnam, there's been an exponential increase in forest cover. And that's because of the extensive tree planting programs that have been implemented there. Whether or not these represent vestiges of biodiversity when they're planting primarily eucalyptus, acacia, and other exotic species is, is a moot point. But if we move further down the table, you can see the, the producers of tropical hardwood the, the, the levels of deforestation uh, that have occurred there over the last uh, 20 to 30 years are, are significant. Um, and you can see Indonesia, um, in, from the second from bottom, a major uh, region of deforestation. So drivers have changed logging. The logging industry re reached its peak in the 1970s to 80s. Um, 
and uh, we've seen uh, major changes in our environment because of logging. My early professional career was spent in West Africa where um, the uh, extraction rate was extremely low, one to two uh, trees per hectare. Uh, because of the ecology of the species concerned. Here with the family Diplocarpaceae, you're able to take out many more species per hectare. So the impact on the residual forest is, is significant. Um, and you can see there again Indonesia and Malaysia being the major countries where uh, logging is, is particularly prevalent. And a major driver of change linked to logging somewhat contentiously uh, is the conversion of land to agriculture. And here you can see uh, the top line uh, the extent that um, land conversion has taken place in Indonesia for conversion primarily to, to oil palm and other uh, cash crops. And if just to focus a, a little bit on oil palm and forest loss, you can see the, the, the level of expansion of, uh, of oil palm is directly correlated to forest loss. Um, and this is something which has been a, a, an issue of global uh, attention, has attracted global attention, it's attracted global um, uh, discourse, um, both positively and negatively, um, and it's something that, that seems to be seems to um, uh, generate a lot of discussion and debate um, amongst the conservation and development community. And this is an interesting slide. We're all aware of the haze, and I don't know how clear the, the images are on the slide on the screen. If you just give me a second, yeah, you can, you can, you can see, see these red dots are actually. Uh, fires during the, the burning season and the resultant haze that occurs. This is South Sumatra uh, and this is Kalimantan here and you can see the extent of the haze that spreads towards northern Sumatra and Singapore. Ah, okay, thank you. It's, it's okay. Um, and uh, recently the Singapore government and Indonesian government have had some, some discourse in, in mitigating this haze and this, this annual burning. Um, and just by sheer coincidence, yesterday the Singapore government contacted C4 uh, and Forda to, to work together to try and address some of these, these drivers of, of the, the, the fires, um, particularly uh, during the burning season. And this is directly related to, to logging uh, and oil palm um, ex expansion. And this is what we're faced with. We've, we, we go from a highly rich, dense um, diptocarpaceae forests full of animals insects and all the elements of biodiversity we all appreciate to, to this. And, and if you travel to Kalimantan or Sumatra or, or anywhere else in, in Southeast Asia, in fact, um, you are often faced with large expanses of, of oil palm. And the wildlife trade um, is something that seems to remain on the periphery of, uh, of the, the, the debate about biodiversity. But this slide actually shows the legal trade in biodiversity. So this uh, number of 13 million is a number of live animals traded in Southeast Asia legally last year. But this is but one small proportion of the actual extent of the trade. And countries such as Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Indonesia are major suppliers of wildlife to the emerging markets in China um, and elsewhere. And of course, I was going to show another map, but I'm, I'm aware of the, the time constraints. The uh, concomitant trade from Africa in, in terms of rhino horn and ivory reaching Southeast Asia and, and being traded throughout many of the countries there, with the end markets being in Vietnam and, uh, and um, uh, China. And of course we've seen the extinction of the, the, the last of the, the Javan rhinos in Vietnam based on this extensive and very lucrative wildlife trade. So in terms of food security, I, I just came from two major food security meetings in Europe. And as I said, uh, C4 have been working on this um, extensively, particularly from the, the linkages between understanding uh, biodiversity and food security linkages. And what we're saying, seeing in terms of, of food security is, of course, changing demographic graphics. Populations are growing across the world. And so people think there's a linear correlation between um, population growth and the need to grow more food. In fact, we grow enough food in the world. We have one billion people who are undernourished, but we have two billion people who are overweight or obese. So there's, there are some problems here in, in the supply chain of, of food, and, and, and that's one issue that needs to be addressed, and that's a political thing which is outside, obviously, the remit of an organization like C4. But we're also seeing changing demographics which have influenced appetites and, and, and diets. As uh, the middle classes emerge and grow, their, their demands on, on the food system are such that they 
would like to eat more meat, for example. Meat is a very uh, inefficient way to, to use uh, the residual land that we have available for agriculture. And so the major driver of change is, in fact, this um, uh, increased affluence, which enables people to diversify their diets because they have purchasing power. And it's interesting, if you take Hong Kong and Singapore, who grow no food whatsoever, they're completely food secure because they have purchasing power. India, for example, which produces a surplus every year, is food insecure because of the inequities in the food distribution system. So uh, the real challenge uh, for Africa and for Asia is, is to how to grow enough nutritious food. It's not just about quantity in terms of calories. You need to have a, a nutritious diet. And some work that we've been doing recently has, has focused on Africa, looking at the correlation between tree cover and dietary diversity and nutrition. And we have found that looking at 93,000 households, that households with closer proximity to tree cover have a more nutritious and, and diverse diet than those who are uh, in the peri-urban or urban situations. So there is a nice correlation that, that, that C4, as a forestry research organization, wants to bring to the table in terms of precipitating policy change to get people to think about food security not just in terms of more rice, more wheat, more grain, but in terms of the diversity that, that forests and other tree-based systems provide. And as I've said earlier, you know, one of the things that we're concerned about is, is the segregation of, food, of um, land use systems. We tend to think of plantations as separate, we tend to think of uh, forests as separate and, 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 and agriculture, all managed in, their, in, their, in a very separate way. But paradigms are changing and the whole prospect of land sharing, land sparing, integrating different functions of land use in the same landscapes, if you like. Um, and this is, again, something that we're, we're very much uh, focusing on. And this, I think, provides some hope for the future in, in integrating stakeholder interests uh, in, a, in a wider landscape process. So in terms of what we call multifunctionality, having many functions in the same landscape, it's basically looking at spatial segregation you know, over uh, spatial area, temporal segregation in terms of you know, uh, different functions at different times within the same landscape, but also uh, at the same time having um, real functionality, multifunctionality, linking biodiversity conservation, linking production systems, linking community management, all of these things in, this, in the same landscape for the mutual benefit of, um, of everybody uh, concerned with that, that particular landscape. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this uh, slide particularly because I'm aware of time, but just the last point, the focus on ecosystem services and agricultural productivity is a key one because we do need to move away from protected areas alone. We need to make sure that all of these integrated processes are actually integrated in a way that, that, that precipitates um, much more coherent management of forested landscapes um, for, for many uh, benefits, including production, including biodiversity conservation, etc. as I've said. The, the real um, crux of multifunctionality is the provision of ecosystem services. And, and ecosystem services are very much underrepresented in the, in the international uh, dialogue on forests, international dialogue on food security, international dialogue on, on conservation. And one thing we're trying to do is link the value of forest-based ecosystem services to agriculture. What is the role of forests in terms of pollination for, for cash crops? What is the role in terms of pest control, if for watershed protection? And I think these are big, bigger questions that we need to start asking ourselves but these things, these things take uh, research, obviously. And I did a little review of, of uh, research issues and, and did a, a small web of science um, uh, search uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, when I knew about this talk. Um, and, and it's interesting that biodiversity research came out very low in terms of uh, the numbers of, of papers published compared to Latin America, compared to, to Africa. And interestingly, much of the distribution of the research here in Asia has been based on, or focused on, on mammals, um, with less so on, on, uh, on other taxonomic groups. And so there's a strong need to look at much greater integration of biodiversity conservation research with good taxonomic research, photo photogeographical research, but also linking closely with the socioeconomic systems in which uh, that research operates. And we, we mentioned the, the millennium, de millennium Development Goals. Not an easy thing to say. Actually, I will take that microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so here we are, almost in 2015. We're not doing so good. 
Uh, we're not doing so good on hunger. As I mentioned, there are two billion people obese, but there are still many, many people who don't have access to adequate diets. We're not doing too good on education either. Um, in terms of poverty alleviation, um, th this has been one of the, the biggest successes of the MDGs, but food prices can affect this dramatically. The, the spike in food prices that occurred in 2008 put one million people f back into the poverty trap. Um, and so small levels of fluctuations in, in commodity prices can have a huge impact on, on poverty. So we, we talk about the Millennium Development Goals and we, we have resoundingly, I think, not succeeded in achieving all of the targets that, that we had hoped for. And now we're working on the Sustainable Development Goals uh, for post-2015. And C4 are, are working um, with the UN on trying to get at least a, a sustainable development goal on landscapes, on integrated landscape approaches, the kind of thing that I've been talking about, integrating multiple functions in a single landscape. And I wonder, and I hope, that that dis does give us hope for the, for the, the future in terms of, of uh, integrating socioeconomic, um, political, cultural, and biodiversity concerns into, into one package, if you like. And the environment, I think, you know, we all, we all realize it's more than dollars alone. And we need to think about the intrinsic value of the environment and not just think about the opportunity cost of oil palm because it's there, because it's now. And I'll end there. So thank you very much for your time and I appreciate the, the musical interlude. <laughs>